Yes, friend, yes. This is a positive remedy for weariness, turgidity of the bowels, and, uh, uh, and, uh, say, you're an Indian, aren't you? Well, sir, this is the very best thing for those who can't handle their liquor. <laughs> What's in it? I, I, I don't know various things. I'm only the salesman. You're drinking. Never get high on your own supply. We see it in rap music, pop culture, and big tech. But what does it mean? The question answering site Quora defines it as referring to not doing drugs you are going to sell if you are a dealer. Your supply is the drugs, so you shouldn't use it and then have nothing left. But I think that's a little too much of an essentialist definition. In the case of Zuck and Gates, it's not that they abstain from the very products that made them billionaires because they're worried about cutting into their own supply. And not just them, their families and children abstain from these products too. They do it not because they would hurt their own supply chain, but because the product is poisonous and harmful. This could make more sense from the perspective of a heroin dealer. The product they sell makes them insanely rich beyond their wildest dreams, and it does it quickly. The problem is that part of the reason for their quick success, whether it's tech or heroin, is that their product is highly addictive, and never mind the consequences of their product's dangerous side effects. All throughout our pop culture and memes, there's a reoccurring theme that the rich elites in power have a seeming aversion to the very poisons they peddle. Mark Zuckerberg is arguably one of the most influential tech giants of his time, creating the very social network that started the dot-com boom. Yet he himself, who promotes these devices across all of his platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, keeps tape on his laptop camera and his laptop microphone, mirroring the salesman from the outlaw Josie Wales. This shows that even as much as he tries to sell his own product, he does not have faith in it. Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, and Steve Jobs all share a similar trait of the drug dealer, where they do not consume their own product for themselves, their friends, or their family. They even keep their children out of normal school. Bill Gates said that his children would never have iPads. And Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, in addition to limiting technology for their own children, also send their children to an elitist school that is technology free. These tech giants send their own children to what is practically an Amish school for teaching the old ways, quote. <laughs> Lesson number two, don't get high on your own supply. That's right. Let's... Here we see in movies, pop culture, and memes a reoccurring theme. Never get high on your own supply. But what about music? Light that ass up, number four. Know you heard this before. Never get high on your own supply, number four. Rap music has always been on the leading edge of counterculture. And it's very interesting to see how the rap community was among the first to repeat this message. B.I.G. wasn't the only rapper echoing this sentiment. Man got plenty. To be a dope man, boy, you must qualify. Don't get high off your own supply. Most of the famous pop culture commentators of our time point out the dangers of these products and the hypocrisy from the founders. What do you think is the root cause of the shift? I think they've started living on their devices. It's kind of like along about 2007 or 8, like it seems like airplanes flew over the country and just started dropping smartphones and everybody's head went from here to here. 
I mean, think about it. When you when you look, you go anywhere, go to the mall, go just anywhere there's a group, and what do you see in their hands? You see a device. We didn't grow up with devices. When I started Dr. Phil 21 years ago, the first text hadn't been sent. There were no social media platforms. None of that stuff was going on. Technology is great. I'm not, listen, I love technology. Um, but we've got generations that started living virtually. They're watching people live their lives instead of living their own lives. And that changed the metrics on everything. Think about that. TikTok, Instagram, all of this, you're watching other people live their lives instead of living your own. And that changed everything. They also point out the dependence on these products that we've created for ourselves, almost to the point that simple tasks when going about daily life are now nearly impossible. Mm -hmm. That's that. That's the phone is the big one, right? Well, the phone, the phone is is the gift and the curse. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that we we shot out the gate and saw the gift. Oh my God! It's 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 community. It's connecting us. We're able to share. We're able to meet new people. We're we're able to stay in communication with with old people. Find new people. As an entertainer, I can engage with my fans, and this is so dope. And then after that, you get hit with the the curse. These devices. Yeah. These devices are the easiest way to touch everybody. So when you're just consumed on that shit all day. You start to see yourself being a part of the negative shit. Yeah. So what I've learned to do is go. I don't. I don't need to see that. I don't need to mm. see that shit. I don't. I don't pay that any mind. I don't read that shit for bullshit. Yeah. So I don't let the device <laughs> beat me. And at one point, I definitely did. At one point, it was everything. But when you see the bad side of it, I, I thought the other day, this is some real shit, and it really made me think. My phone died. My phone died and I'm driving and I was using the fucking maps. And I was like, oh shit. What the fuck? How am I get to where? <laughs> I don't know where I'm going. And I sat and I was like, yo, how did we how did we get from point A to point B before the map shit? What what were we doing? That I used to print out directions from Google Maps. I remember that. But then before that, how did you get to the places where you were going that you didn't know how to get to? I don't even remember. Do you remember? <laughs> but it really fucked me up because I was like, how do we don't even know how how to do the common yeah. the, the the norm anymore because the device has made everything available and I literally had to to drive to a, a store where I could buy a charger, charge up my phone to get back and use the map to get to where the fuck I was going because I had no idea how to get there. This is one of my favorite parts of the podcast where Kevin Hart explains how the smartphone, which was once a convenience, has now become a necessity just for the everyday activity of traveling from one place to another. I had no I didn't know no numbers by heart. I didn't know who I was gonna call. <laughs> what what phone like yo, this was the moment where I was like, what level of success have I reached? I just pulled over and I sat there and I was like, how the fuck am I gonna get to where you I'm going? You should have a spare phone, man. It, I don't know what it you was. Need a backup phone. It felt like the end of the world. It <laughs> felt like it felt like it was over. I was like, shit. Isn't that crazy how it, dependent you are? But that's when the light bulb started to click. Yeah. It started to click like how how did we function without? I want to go backwards a little bit. Yeah. It's still there. I still need it. I still think it's dope with all of the things that we can do on it, but I still want to be able to put it down and and step away from it. Yeah. I want my kids to be able to step away from it. That's why when I come in the house, my phone is up. Cuz I can't I can't bitch and complain at y'all about being on your phone if you see me doing the same thing. Right, right. So that time those conversations, me wanting to know about your day, you talking to me about your day, your friends, who you like, who don't you like, my daughter, you, what boy, who, what, huh, no, <laughs> all right, God, my son, yeah, I like somebody, who, oh, Jesus, here it comes, it's, it's, it's a great thing, and I want to be able to have those moments, and, you know, I think it's, it's, it's big to make sure that you prioritize that. Are you worried about what comes next? 
hundred percent. I'm worried that something's gonna be way more intrusive than that. It's it's what do you mean? It's already happening. Yeah. Apple uh, on the iPhones, it was like people could listen into your. Oh yeah, if you didn't even pick up, they yeah, could FaceTime. They you. could just listen into yeah. it. Yeah, and you know that was the scariest shit ever, because yeah. it's if it's that easy to have a bug like that. What's the thing that's not a bug? That's there that you just don't know about. Oh, there's definitely government listening to us right 100%. now. Hundred percent. Yeah, one hundred percent. Recording everything everybody says, and then in case one day you do something wrong, they they'll go back pull to you it. aside. Mr. Hart, we'd like you to sit down for a minute. 100%. We're gonna play you something. Hundred percent. Yeah. So the fear is the next level of immersion uh, intrusive. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I think everything has become intrusive now. Like the toughest thing for me is that there is no. There is no privacy outside my home. But everyone's losing their privacy. Yeah, yeah. Slowly but surely. It's it's happening to you because you're very famous and mm -hmm. because you do something that's in the public eye mm -hmm. and people want to see you and they want to stick their camera in front of you. But there's going to come a point in time where what we're dealing with now, which is like you have to turn your phone on, you have to, you know, you have to reach out to somebody, you have to put something up. That's that step's going to be out of the way. And mm -hmm. it's just going to be people being able to access your life. Yeah. How did we get here as a society where just to travel from one place to another, you must have a pocket sized supercomputer with you at all times and fully charged with some sort of source of electricity. It is now nearly impossible to do dozens of basic things during the COVID-19 pandemic. Some cities even implemented digital passports for restaurants, gymnasiums, and pretty much any amenity that was not a grocery store. You had to have a device with you at all times, or you were treated as subhuman. You were unable to go about daily life without your phone on you at all times. These corporate giants know this. Bill Gates was one of the biggest propagators of COVID-19 regulations. And all of these regulations do what? Require you to have his product. Hart ends his discussion of societal dependence on technology by discussing how it's important to set a good example for his kids by putting the phone down and having some technology free time. Another Joe Rogan guest, Dr. Jonathan Hydett, discusses the detrimental effects that social media addiction is having on young children. And then, bang, just same as in the thing. last same thing, the rates for girls go shooting up. So the rate for 15 to 19 year old girls is up 62% since 2009. Um, now notice the rate for the millennials, that is the rate for the oldest girls, age 20 to 24, that's only up 17%. So whatever happened, it's not affecting the millennials, it's affecting Gen Z. Uh, so 10 to 14 year old girls, these are preteens. Okay, they didn't used to cut themselves. They used to have very low rates, but bang, beginning in 2010, it shoots up, it's up 189%. It has nearly tripled in the last five or six years. What's the cause? We don't know for sure, but the reason why, so because of the huge sex difference, the leading candidate and the timing, look at that timing, is social media. So if you look at what happened in this country and all around the world, um, Facebook opens up to the world in 2006. You, know, you don't have to be a college student, but very few teenagers have a Facebook account in 2006. 2007, the iPhone comes out, but it's very expensive and very few teenagers have one. By 2010, 2011, around half of American teenagers have an iPhone or Samsung. They have a smartphone and they have access to social media in middle school. Because even though for Facebook and Instagram, I think the minimum age is and was 13, you know, I mean, my, my son is 12, a lot of his friends have Instagram, you just lie. So middle school kids are now getting on social media. By 2010, 2011, you've got a lot of them. And that's what I think is the main cause of this. Now that we know a little bit more about the dangerous side effects of social media, especially on children, the picture becomes a lot more clear as to why social media giants like Bill Gates, and Mark Zuckerberg, and Steve Jobs are not letting their children interact with these devices. It's becoming increasingly clear that the harmful side effects are much worse than initially thought. 
It now seems more clear than ever why these corporate giants don't let their children, family, loved ones, and even some employees have access to these harmful devices. The overstimulation and oversaturation of social media, proposed interconnectivity, and online activity is detrimental to one's mental health. And it's clear that a dependence on these devices for everyday tasks isn't healthy either. One can hardly blame Bill Gates or Steve Jobs for being hesitant to let their children have iPads or iPods. It almost seems more justified than ever to try to send your children to a philosopher's Amish school that bans technology and teaches exclusively the old methods of teaching. It almost makes perfect sense why they do this. The problem is the hypocrisy and the way that they still market these devices as their main brand, their main source of income, their main cash flow, all of their money, all of their success is attributed to the power, the convenience of these technological advancements, yet they themselves do not participate in. These corporate giants practically mandate their products use, yet for them, their employees and their families, technology is all but banned. The reason the salesman in the outlaw Josie Wales doesn't drink his snake oil is because he knows something that the customer doesn't. Clearly there's some lack of faith in their own product, so much for practicing what you preach. The great Blondin, probably the evil Knievel of his day, was notorious for his incredible death-defying feats. On one occasion, he strung a tightrope across Niagara Falls, connecting New York and Canada along a thin cable. As a crowd gathered, he stood before them and said, How many of you believe that I, the Great Blondin, can walk across this tightrope to the other side? They all said, We believe, we believe. So he walked across the tightrope and came back again. The people applauded, thrilled by his death-defying feat. He then challenged the crowd, how many of you believe that I can do it blindfolded? Again, the crowd roared, we believe, and he completed the stunt unfazed. Then he said, how many of you believe that I, the great Blondin, can not only walk back across that tightrope, but this time do it while I push a wheelbarrow? We believe, they yelled louder, wanting to see him do this. Then he said, how many of you really believe it? Oh, we really believe it, they shouted back. So Blondin brought the wheelbarrow over to them and said, get in. There's a clear difference between saying you believe and true faith. Saying you want to see someone go across the tightrope, anyone can say they believe that. True faith is drumping in the wheelbarrow.